Welcome to Judson Memorial Church on this Pride Sunday, where we are celebrating everything that is queer and good. My name is Matthew Nelson. I'm a member of Judson. I welcome you on behalf of our minister, Reverend Micah Busey, and our associate minister, the Reverend Dr. Valerie Holly. And I welcome you on behalf of all the staff at Judson who all contributed to this service and who each have a unique ministry here at Judson uh, that empowers this church. It's such a gift to work with them. Today is Pride Sunday, and it's one of the high holy days here at Judson, so we're very likely to go past the noon hour, but enjoy the embrace of this queer time. Just as a side note, I recognize that not everyone loves the word queer, and I want to hold space for that. And I also know that we reclaim that word that has been used against many of us. I'm surrounded by queer saints that were created by Jason Singh. I think of them as in dialogue with our Jean uh, Lafrage stained glass windows. I think of how we all follow the transformational example of these queer saints. I think of the power of the art through Jason's fingers and how we parade them on this day in the queer liberation march as an act of social justice, as art, as prophecy, and as worship. Towering above me is Saint Marsha P. Johnson. Johnson was a fabulous drag queen. Johnson was in the thick of it during the Stonewall Riots, which this sanctuary was used as sanctuary for some of those rioters. You'll hear more personal stories of Marsha P. Johnson later in the service from the iconic Ruby Rims. At Judson, we start our service with a land acknowledgement, shared today by Mackie Alston. Our physical space stands on the unceded land of the Lenape people. As Natalie Diaz, a queer native poet says, Manhattan is a Lenape word. Judson Memorial Church acknowledges the Lenape community, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. And we make this acknowledgement as part of our work to dismantle the ongoing legacies and lies of Christian supremacy, settler colonialism, and white supremacy. On this day of queer and trans pride, we honor in particular the lives of the indigenous two-spirit ancestors of this land. Two-spirit, a term that Porch Creek scholar and therapist Roger Kuhn defines as, quote, created to describe Native American, USA, and First Nations, Canada, people who experience gender variance and or sexual orientation variance. We honor our living Native, Two-Spirit, queer and trans congregation members, visitors, and neighbors in New York, home to the largest contemporary urban Native population in this nation. And we honor two-spirit, queer and trans native people who will dwell on this land in generations to come. May we honor you not just in word, but in right relationship. May we strive not just for friendship, but may we commit to the lifelong practice of actions that advance your flourishing. Thank you, Mackie. Please join me in our call to worship and our call for transformation. God of transformation, we need you. We need you to look inside ourselves and call on your presence, knit within our very being, holy and acceptable, to call forth the very best of us. God of transformation, push us to look at who we are and how we live in this world of creation. Help us to see the subtleties of colonialism, of white supremacy and Christian supremacy. God of transformation, help us claim our creative nature as we join in worship. Amen. 
please join me in our opening hymn, When the Saints Come Marching In. The ancient testimony comes from Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And also Hebrews 12, just the first part of verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is before us. In our modern testimony, we actually have two sections. The first section is the artists. Hear how the personal is political, how the artist pushes us to embrace all of ourselves, how art leads to protest, how art is birthed out of the suffering, and how your voice within you must be shared. I first met the man who is now my dissertation advisor when I showed up at one of his book launch parties a handful of years ago and asked him to sign his newest book for me, Langston's Salvation. With his poems, his plays, his novels, his essays, and his powerful persona, Langston Hughes came to epitomize the Harlem Renaissance. In this book, Wallace Best honors the evidence of queerness in Langston's life. There is plenty of evidence. But Wallace also insists on honoring what he calls Langston's purposeful evasiveness with regard to sexuality. And not just sexuality, but also with regard to his spirituality. In 1933, Langston published a little-known poem titled Personal, which simply reads, In a letter marked personal, God has written me a letter. In an envelope marked personal, I have given God my answer. Even so, for Langston, the personal was often still political. He wrote that poem in response to mounting criticism that his poetry and that he himself was anti-religious. The poems Goodbye Christ and Christ in Alabama were particularly controversial to many. But here's where Langston reminds me of Judson and Judson reminds me of Langston. Both have modeled over many years creative expression as social critique of religion and of the world around us, not for the sake of critiquing religion merely, but for the sake of transforming ourselves and transforming our world. Long before James Cone, 
Langston proclaimed that Christ is beaten and black and proclaimed that if we're going to transform the world in the ways the world must be transformed, then we're going to have to say goodbye to some of those other Christs. And why not do it with artistic flair? I follow the transformational example of St. Langston Hughes. My name is Veronica Vera, and I'm here to talk about St. Robert Maplethorpe. I met Robert Maplethorpe in the 1980s and enjoyed two collaborations with him. He helped me to explore myself as a sexual human being, as a sexual, sexually explicit woman. We collaborated twice in two photo shoots, and not only did he bring me more out into the open, but he brought darker parts of human sexuality, the parts that I could identify with, with my, from my own Catholic background, which was similar to his, things that have uh, resonated with s &M imagery. And I was very, very appreciative that he helped to bring this out into the light, these darker parts of our human sexuality. And this is something that I've carried on in my own life from that early time. And that's always been a part of me. I continue to follow the transformational example of St. Robert Mablethorpe. The American theater would be a healthier place today if Terrence McNally's parents had smothered him in the cradle. One New York City critic wrote that in his review for Terrence McNally's first Broadway play, And Things That Go Bump in the Night. <laughs> Can you imagine? 1965 and this young, brash Colombian graduate writes honestly and openly about sex and homosexuality for Broadway, almost 10 years before Al Carmine's wrote The Faggot off-Broadway. Incidentally, the play's premiere engagement in Minneapolis was directed by Judson's own Lawrence Kornfeld. Unfortunately, the show only ran 16 performances off-Broadway. Luckily, Terrence McNally didn't let one or maybe two critics' death wish stop him from writing plays and books for musicals. His plays include Masterclass, Andre's Mother, Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune, The Ritz, Love, Valor, Compassion, Mothers and Sons, and Deuce, which starred Angela Lansbury and Marion Seldes watching a tennis match. And who could forget Corpus Christi, which depicts Jesus and his disciples as homosexuals living in Texas. This one was protested by Bill Donahue and the Catholic League and was almost canceled in New York City. Art that leads to protest. I love it. McNally also wrote the book for many amazing Broadway musicals, including The Rink with Liza Minnelli and Cheetah Rivera, Kiss of the Spider Woman, Anastasia, and two of my favorites, Ragtime and The Visit. If you haven't seen these two shows, ask me about them and I will tell you every little detail. Terrence McNally was not afraid to be out and proud at a time when very few famous people were. He once broke off a four-year relationship with playwright Edward Albee because he did not want to be living in the closet. Even in the 60s and 70s, he wanted an honest, open relationship. In his lifetime, Terrence McNally received five Tony Awards, including the 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award, where he said, not a moment too soon. Little did he know how prescient those words would be. I was devastated to learn he was one of the early victims of COVID-19. He died March 24th, 2020, at the age of 81. Thankfully, those early critics can choke on their words. Terrence McNally was not just a gay playwright. 
he is considered one of the great American playwrights. I follow the transformational example of St. Terence McNally. Today, we honor Audre Lorde, sister outsider. Audre Lorde was born in 1934 here in New York City to Caribbean immigrant parents. From birth, she was an outlier. She described herself as, quote, black, lesbian, mother, warrior, and poet. All of these qualities she transformed into a brilliant life as a poet, teacher, and political activist. She worked as a librarian and a teacher in the CUNY system. This was her city. In her teaching, organizing, and writing, she contributed to the development of contemporary feminist theory, critical race theory, and queer theory. Let's look for a moment at her creativity. When she was a child, she dropped the Y from her first name, Audrey, because she wanted her first and last names to be symmetrical. So they both had to end in E and have five letters. Uh, as a young woman, she announced her second name in her autobiography, Mythography, and its name was Zami a new spelling of my name. Her third name she took shortly before her untimely death at age 58 of breast cancer. With a number of her women friends, they did a ritual and she assumed a name to honor her African ancestors, Gamba Adisa, and it means warrior, she who makes her meaning known. Because I was a women's studies professor, I knew Audre Lorde mainly through her poems and essays. We were not personally acquainted. Yet I have a very strong memory of her presenting at women's studies conferences mainly. I remember one in particular where she strode into the room with great confidence and gave a a memorable critical essay entitled, The Uses of the Erotic. We hung on her every word. Another of her famous essays is titled, The Master's Tools Will Not Dismantle the Master's House. She gave that at an NYU conference just down the street. She always challenged us to think with compassion and complexity, and to dedicate ourselves to the fulfillment of women's dreams. She wrote of the intersection of racism, classism, homophobia, and sexism. I wish I had time to read you some of her poems, but they are widely available on the internet. They're very punchy, and she will, with her words, you'll just feel stabbed in the heart and uh, cut in the gut as well. She is completely relevant today in all of her writings. Her accomplishments are many, and I'll just mention a few. She, one of her 12 books won the National Book Award. She was the Poet Laureate of New York State. She founded the Kitchen Table Press with two other women, which was a press dedicated to publishing the work of women of color. She is one of 50 American pioneers and trailblazers who are uh, inscribed in the wall of honor at the Stonewall Memorial, just down the street from here. And we were there, some of us were there, at the dedication of that national monument. Her name, along with that of Matthew Collin, who was also um, uh, honored here today, the two of them are named 
and honored in the first free clinic uh, in New York City. And now there are four branches of it uh, giving free health care to LGBTQ people. Finally, I want to say that the Black Lives Matter movement that has been so important all over the world this past year is founded, was founded by three queer African American young women. I'm pretty sure that Audre Lorde had something to do with their thinking and influenced them deeply. I follow the transformational example of Saint Audre Lorde. Sometimes it seems like everybody I know has their own personal Alvin Ailey story. For me, it was in eighth grade when my mother took me to a stop on his tour. I went into the theater a repressed gay middle school misfit, and I came out an artist. In the ways in which he overcame, in the ways in which he made art out of suffering that gives recognition, release, elation, expression, revelation for his people, for black people, and for people all over the world. I pray that I may follow the transformational example of St. Alvin Ailey. These queer saints always show their true colors. The West Village Chorale will show their true colors now. Artists could easily, easily be named as activists too, but hear the stories of these queer saints who boldly lived their lives and changed my life and changed our lives. 
St. Christine Jorgensen. Christine Jorgensen was born George William Jorgensen in the Bronx on May 30th, 1926, and served in the Army during World War II. He always felt that he should have been born a girl, and at the age of 24, went to Denmark to become one of the first people to transform into a transgender. A book and a movie were made about her life. I had the pleasure of meeting Christine in Provincetown in 1981. We played the same room at the Pilgrim House, but at different times. While I was in Provincetown, I had a habit of going fishing. I love to fish. So one day, Christine said, I'd love to go fishing with you. And so we did, along with Sharon McKnight, Clay Corey, and another gentleman who worked at the Pilgrim House, at 7 o'clock in the morning, Sharon was still half crocked from the night before, and um, Christine was walking down the street in a beautiful dress and a hat, in which Sharon said, you can't wear that. <laughs> You'll ruin it. Ruby, go get her a T-shirt. So I went and got, got Christine a Ruby Rims T-shirt, and she wore it fishing. And as fate would have it, we got on the boat, and we were a sight for sore eyes. And um, there were two women on the boat, and it turned out that one of them was a transgender. Well, she and Christine just hit it off and talked most of the day. But as fate would have it, Christine was the only one of us to catch a fish. Christine died in in San Clemente, California, on May 3rd, 1998. My name is Veronica Vera. I'm proud to speak on St. Christine Jorgensen. St. Christine Jorgensen helped make my work possible, but I never imagined I would have anything to do with her life or she with mine. As a young girl growing up in New Jersey, when I saw her face and photo and those uh, words splashed across the headlines, first sex change operation, this was strange to me. I didn't even know she was American. (laughs) But she continued to inspire so many people. And when I started Miss Vera's Finishing School for Boys Who Want to Be Girls, the world's first transgender academy, she inspired my students. Just the other night, I was on a Zoom with our local cross-gender support group, and they asked a question of who they would invite to a dinner party of people who influenced them in their lives. Devin, who has transitioned, said, Christine Jorgensen, because she gave me hope. And Liana, who is living in both worlds, as female and as male, said, it was fantastic for me to know as a young child that someone could transition and lead a fantastic life. Christine Jorgensen has helped many people by her example to find their true identity, to pursue that in whatever way they can, through science, through just pure courage, through finding support from other people. And I'm proud to say that I follow the example, the transformational example of St. Christine Jorgensen. One of our earliest Judson queer saints is St. Robert Spike. Bob Spike, as I knew him, was the minister of Judson Church from 1947 to 1956. His ministry here got Judson started on the path we are still following of combining worship, arts, and justice as our ministries. And for that reason alone, he should be one of our saints. But they're far more important uh, for his sainthood was Bob Spike's work with the National Civil Rights Movement in the early 1960s. When he left Judson, he went to work for the United Church of Christ, and from there he moved into being a leader in the National Council of Churches, where he headed up the the then new Commission on Religion and Race. From that position, he organized Protestant churches all across the country 
to send people to the 1963 March on Washington for their own education and to show support for civil rights, which was only just then beginning to, to, to hit Congress. The next, the major thing that he did after that was with Bob Moses, as a black civil rights hero, to organize the 1964 Freedom Summer. That was the project in which college students from all over the country were asked to come down to Mississippi for the summer to work with the then early and dangerous movement to register black voters for the first time. For those reasons his, of his civil rights leadership, Bob Spike deserves to be called a saint. Whether he's actually a queer saint is open to question. So far as we at Judson knew, he was a happily married man with a charming wife and two little boys. But he began to be known as queer because only because of the circumstances of his tragic death. One morning in 1966, we awoke to the news that, that Spike, who had been in Columbus, Ohio on a, at a conference, had been found dead, bludgeoned to death, outside a gay bar. That started a lot of speculation. We gathered at the church trying to figure out what happened and to mourn and remember. I know that those of us who were in the closet even then about our own sexual orientation understood perfectly why he would not have wanted to be public if in fact he was bisexual. Although we, we agreed it was nothing to be ashamed of. Now we consider him our first queer Judson minister and therefore our Judson saint. I follow the transformational example of Saint Robert Spike by helping Judson stay on the path he set for us working for racial justice and gay rights, queer rights. When uh, Matthew sent out the email and asked us to choose queer saints who had impacted our lives and, and to speak on that impact, um, I hurriedly sent back an email and I said, well, I I'll speak on Bayard Rustin or David Bowie, whichever isn't taken. And Matthew wrote back, well, do them both. And, and so I read that email and I thought, oh, um... Because, well, how do you tackle both Bayard Rustin and David Bowie in one little video? I mean, how do you synthesize what both of those men uh, mean to me in one statement of faith and appreciation? I mean, Bayard Rustin, a gay black man who fought for civil rights on behalf of people of color and later on behalf of LGBTQ people, on behalf of the marginalized, the oppressed, and a lot of his work was behind the scenes, often kept behind the scenes because of his sexuality. Um, I look at Bayard Rustin and I see a man always trying to lift people up through the good revolutionary work of lifting people up. And often without due credit in his time. And then you've got David Bowie, whose work is often the flash, the persona, the persona, the radical glitz where the appearance is the revolution. The revolution is the appearance and there's nothing behind the scenes about it. And all of that to entice you into the work. So my models for living my queer saints are a man who did the work of lifting people up, often behind the scenes, and a man whose work was often the scene itself. And I chose them. And probably many of my peers today, uh, the other folks who've made videos today, uh, they would have chosen two or three or four saints themselves because our identities as queer people, as people in general, are multifarious. Bayard Rustin held many different views throughout his life, uh, but always with the goal of lifting up black and queer and marginalized people. 
David Bowie was multiple people throughout his life, but always to express his multiple identities, identities in which queer people, marginalized people, found themselves, found affirmation. And like both of them, I want to do that work. They inspire me to do that work, both the work that happens behind the scenes and the out in the open work of just being my loud, proud, queer self. And for those reasons, I follow the transformational examples of Saints Bayard Rustin and David Bowie. Hello, Judson. I am Michael Crumpler and so excited to be with you on this Pride Sunday. Thank you, Matthew, so much for making this so beautiful and collaborative. I am here to talk a little bit about my patron saint, James Baldwin. So James Baldwin, I learned about James Baldwin before I arrived at Union, but I learned about James Baldwin when I was uh, at Union and taking a class uh, that was being taught by uh, Dr. James Cone, uh, <clears throat> the father of Black liberation. And there's nothing like being taught about James Baldwin by James Cone. So much so that I um, ended up uh, writing my thesis, which was essentially uh, a journey through my life as a queer person, as a Black person. Um, and, and, uh, and it ended with James Baldwin and James Cone. And um, they, James Cone was like the first person I saw that really, really represented who I, who I am and who I want to be. Um, you know, James, James, James Baldwin was sexual, James Baldwin was poor, James Baldwin was smart, James Baldwin was cosmopolitan, uh, you know, he left the church to preach the gospel. And, you know, when I left the church, uh, you know, after coming out, I didn't necessarily leave the church to preach the gospel. However, uh, learning about James Baldwin reframed my experience as a Christian and has reframed my experience as a Black person. So James Baldwin is my patron saint. And uh, everything I do and everything I say comes from the spirit of Baldwin. I just love him so. And happy Pride. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> Marsha P. Johnson was born Malcolm Michaels Jr., on August 24th in 1945 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Known as an advocate for gay rights, Marsha was one of the prominent figures of Stonewall Uprising. The very first place I ever performed at in New York was the Limelight, not the church, the original Limelight on 7th Avenue. I can remember one evening, I was walking for my, one of my very first times down Christopher Street with my friend Jimmy G. And we got to the corner of Bleecker and Christopher, and we could hear this voice. Jimmy said to me, oh, Miss Marsh is out tonight. Well, I walked down the street, and Marsha yelled, hi, Miss Jimmy. <laughs> and that was my first meeting with Marsha P. Johnson. I would learn and get to know Marsha throughout the years. She was crazy, nuts, loud, but she loved her people. The queen had a heart of gold. And I remember years back when I was working at the Anvil, she would come to the Anvil and they wouldn't let her in because I was the only drag queen that ever worked at the Anvil. And in those days, they didn't allow drag queens. Well, Marsha took off her dress, got into a pair of cut-off jeans, a white tank top, 
took most of the makeup off her face, but uh, you it's very hard to take off glitter because once glitter, as Micah can tell you, once glitter's on, it's on. And Marcia came into the anvil. Marcia would make a dollar any way Marcia could make a dollar. Whether she sold joints, whether she sold anything else. But the hard to go thing I learned when any time Marcia came in, what little she had, there was always a dollar tip on stage. <laughs> always. She cared about people. The flowers came from the flower market that were being thrown out, usually on Friday night or Saturday afternoon. And Marcia would go up there and save those flowers and turn them still into beauty, even though they were on their way out. There's been questions throughout the years of Marcia's death. And all I can tell you is that I know that our friend, Marcia and my friend Bob, who ran, managed the loft on Christopher Street, had told me when I found out about Marcia, that Marcia had been hallucinating. Uh, Marcia liked her goodies. And, um, and um, God bless her. But Marcia was hallucinating and said to Bob that she had seen her father in the water. We'll never know the real truth of that. But we'll all know, we'll, we'll, know, we'll never know the truth of that, but we will know one thing. There was nobody in this world like Marsha P. Johnson. I sometimes wonder if I ever got to see Marsha again, wherever, what she would think of all this. And I think she would turn to me and say, pay it no mind, Miss Ruby, pay it no mind. I follow the transformational example of St. Marcia P. Johnson. Hi, I'm Ted Dawson. Uh, I, I never knew Larry Kramer personally, uh, although I crossed paths with Larry many times, primarily through my association with Bailey House, where I was one of the founding members and a longtime board member. Uh, a man named Roger McFarlane, who was on the Bailey House board at the time when I was there, we and he, he and I became good friends. Roger was the first executive director, paid executive director at GMHC, which Larry founded. So that's how I crossed paths with him so many times. But if you were a gay man in New York in the early 80s, you knew who Larry Kramer was. Uh, for many of us, it was a love-hate relationship. Larry was very, very active and vocal in telling us all about what was happening around us, that something was happening was going to kill us. I have a very distinct memory of going out to Fire Island, which I started to do in the early 80s, and getting off the ferry onto the dock, and there is Larry Kramer standing there with brochures and paper and yelling at all of us to, you know, don't do what you're about to do. Don't have a good time. You're killing yourselves. You're killing yourselves. Wake up. Well, that was a hard thing for many of us to hear at the time. We had just come out of the 70s and gay liberation, and we were all feeling our oats. And the last thing we wanted to do after being raised in a world where we were told gay was bad was for someone else to tell us gay was bad. To get it, gay sex was bad. But Larry was doing that. Thank God. Larry then, soon thereafter, with a, a, a number of his acquaintances, founded GMHC, the first, the first organization to deal with the AIDS epidemic. That was in 1982. Uh, Larry then became a little dissatisfied with the organization immediately because it became much more of a social service organization and he wanted to be much more active, much more in your face, much more of a radical organization. 
I always remember reading an article in the New York Native, which was a public gay publication at the time, and this was in uh, March of 83. And the title of the article that Larry wrote and was published in that publication, the Native, was 1,112 and counting. And it was tough. A long article basically laying it on the line to all of us what was happening and what we had to do. Soon thereafter, in, in I think early summer of that year, I went, and I'll never forget it, to the first GMHC fundraiser, which was a, at Madison Square Garden, and it was a Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. The place was packed. It was a joyous event in many ways. But I always remember Larry Kramer, and this is basically what he said in the article in The Native, standing in the center circle ring, I should say, with Mayor Koch, whom he did not like, and basically telling us all, take a look around you. Look around you. Half the people you see around you will not be alive in a year from now. What a way to start a joyous evening, right? We all thought so. Larry then soon resigned from GMHC because it wasn't, it wasn't radical enough for him. It wasn't, he wanted to get the word out and not help people in the way they were doing it. He took a little sabbatical from his leadership in the AIDS crisis and he wrote The Normal Heart, which I know many of us have seen. I saw it at the public theater and it rocked my world. It was just incredible. It was, in fact, the longest running theater performance play ever to be produced at the public theater. And that changed a lot of the attitudes and perceptions about gay people and the world during that time. Larry then decided in 1987 that he wanted to get back in the leadership role to help stop this plague help his friends who were dying left and right. My friends were dying left and right. He then co-founded ACT UP, which many of us know. He, he then again, you know, decided that he, he was an advocate of, uh, of Martin Luther King's civil disobedience. As Judsonites, I think we can, that really resonates with us. And Larry really believed that. He was arrested numerous times. ACT UP was, the people in ACT UP were arrested all, all year long, everywhere they went in Washington, scaling the heights of the government buildings there, in front of the White House, trying to get Ronald Reagan to say the word AIDS, which he finally did. He literally changed the course, and his friends at ACT UP, he literally changed the course of American history, of gay history, and of, of the AIDS epidemic. He, it would not have changed without his vigilance and his activism. He kept fighting for us. And no better tribute than Dr. Fauci himself, who said, quote, in American medicine, there are two eras, before Larry and after Larry, end quote. What more can I say? What more can anyone say? I'd like to end by referring to an interview that the gay writer uh, Eric Marcus, who many of you know, did. He interviewed Larry a number of years ago. And at the end of the interview, he asked Larry what he thought he'd be most remembered as for. And Larry said, you know, probably his writing, particularly his play, The Normal Heart, and, and some of the other writings he did, and Eric said at the risk of disagreeing with him, and I agree with this totally, that he thought Larry's biggest legacy was saving lives through the activism he inspired and his warnings about AIDS, which were heard by more than a few of us, including me. A lot of us, Eric said, and I would say this too, owe our lives to Larry Kramer. Larry, Larry died 
May 27th, 2020. And for that, I follow the transformational example of St. Larry Kramer. Thank you. These saints are superstars, but we were all born superstars. We are born this way. Take it away, Judson Choir. My mama told me when I was young, we're all born superstars. She rolled my hair and put my lipstick on in the glass of her boudoir. There's nothing wrong with loving who you are, she said, cause he made you perfect, babe. So hold your head up, girl, and you'll go far. Listen to me when I say, I'm here to fold my way. The storm is so mistakes. I'm on the right track, baby, I was born this way. No hide yourself in regret, just love yourself and be sad. Love the Judson Choir. Born This Way was awesome. So, Jason, can you tell us a little bit about these queer saints and how they came to be, and how do you decide which ones? Thanks for the question. Yeah, so um, the Queer Saints Project started back in 2018. Uh, the idea actually came from Micah, and he wanted to create some kind of object that we could um, carry with us um, during the Pride Parade. And there were a lot of ideas that we had at the time. Like we had this idea of creating these like paper mache sculptures that would be representative. It's actually kind of like my, uh, uh, Marsha here. Um, but we, you know, that, that we could have these like larger than life like puppets that we could like walk through the mm -hmm. parade. And that, that seemed a little, um, Adventurous, <laughs> or at least in our times table, and so you know we, we we sat down and said you know but you know what we can do is we can uh, create some like uh, uh, po you know posters, mm -hmm. um, and 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 print them onto stakes and carry them, and I think um, the idea behind uh, kind of um, uh, we were really attracted to the idea of. Uh, venerating or uplifting mm -hmm. these queer ancestors, people that we don't um, in kind of common society or common history acknowledge. Mm -hmm. And so that, that became a really interesting idea. Um, in terms of who selected, it, it's, it was um, honestly at the very beginning, it was just kind of a mad dash to get as many people onto the list as possible. There was kind of a, 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 a word document that was drawn up really quickly of all the people that we could think of. Um, we obviously tried to be mindful about you know diversity, racial, and gender, um, but yeah, the, the, the you know I think that like I would like to to say that there was like a really kind of a like reasoned and like almost like systematic process mm -hmm. of like choosing these ancestors, but really it was just um, uh, the, the first 
sorry, batch, you know, because we relied so heavily on, on, on photographs, mm -hmm. uh, there was, you know, a limitation of, of who we could, you know, venerate because, you know, we could, we could only go back so far, so far. And, you know, a lot of pe people, a lot of our queer ancestors, you know, they, th it's very difficult to, to find, you know, archival footage or, or, mm -hmm. or photographs of them. Um, and so that was part of the, the, the challenge of that. Great, great. And um, why don't you tell me like, how this whole service came to be? It was a really interesting process watching you kind of put it all together. <laughs> well, it started with the Reverend Dr. Valerie Holly asking me, and of course, you can't say no to her. <laughs> so um, absolutely, I said, yes, I would be honored to put together a worship service. And at the same time, I was watching you post some of these queer icons um, on Facebook. And I thought, this would be a great opportunity for us to marry those two things together, um, share some of the stories of these queer saints, um, and especially because Judson has such a rich history of connection to some of them. Um, I thought it would be powerful to hear some of those personal stories, which we heard, um, which brought tears to my eye. They were so powerful. And I have to confess to you, Jason, some of these folks, I did not know their history. When you say, you know, we wanted to lift up uh, some of these queer saints that are lost in history, it was an education for me. And these are my people. So having the opportunity to share these saints uh, with Judson um, and their history seemed like a really powerful thing to do. So who drew you to this project to name and uplift these queer saints? Yeah, um, well, uh, I think one of the, part of the, part of the, the, the reason I feel I felt so kind of motivated to um, devote so much of my time to creating all of these images is because, you know, like my, my family has like a long history of uh, kind of like ancestor veneration. I come from a Chinese American household. We obviously don't call it uh, ancestor worship in my <laughs> Christian home. It's like, it's, you know, kind of encased in this kind of like respect for your ancestors or your, your, um, uh, your the people who came before, mm -hmm. but you know it's like you know we lay out you know offerings and mm -hmm. bow to these images, and so I was I was very uh, 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 inclined on you know the idea that you know the 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 people that we can claim as saints, mm -hmm. the people that we can venerate are um, don't have to come from a specific institution, mm -hmm. and we can choose you know who we claim and who we lift up. Um, another thing that that really uh, excited me. Um, was uh, that exactly how you said, you know, like a lot of these people on the list, I did not have an intimate, you know, mm. encyclopedic knowledge of. And so, you know, as you do the research you know, with, with each image, you know, I tried to uh, uh, re re reference or tr uh, recognize the, the person's, you know, biographical or history or mm -hmm. their accomplishments in their work. And in doing so, you know, it was a history lesson for me in, in, in learning all these things. And what's even more, like, like the, the, the deeper and deeper you go, the, the more you realize how many stories um, are just left untold. And it's, it's infuriating, but also kind of exciting too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this past year, I mean, aside from a pandemic, uh, we've also been wrestling with this great, you know, reckoning in terms of racial equity. Um, I know that uh, racial equity was something that went into the, the selection of Saints for the Queer Saints Project, but how do you think it um, kind of hits you today, you know, as you look at, back at all these icons? Yeah, they, they say a lot. Um, and, and like I said, this is my queer history and I don't even know it. So I think that the power of having these, surrounded by these saints and their stories um, is a social justice and racial equity effort. Um, that we've done. You know, last year at uh, the Pride Service, um, the opening number, uh, the opening piece was a black and white video of uh, Sylvia Rivera speaking across the way in Washington Square Park underneath the arch to a predominantly white audience. And they hissed and booed Sylvia. And for me, that is part of what this work is about is claiming the history, um, acknowledging the pain and the suffering that some of that caused, um, and honoring um, Sylvia Marsha P. Johnson, 
for the work they did over and over, challenging us um, despite being um, attacked, uh, diminished, um, not just by you know, those blatant homophobic racists, but also our own inaction from the rest of us. Um, so for me, they literally presented their bodies as living sacrifices. And their bodies are holy to God. Amen. Amen. Um, and, and you lift them up for us. You, you create this space for us to think about these folks. And each of us need to look inside and educate our own selves, learn about um, being an anti-racist. Um, and, you know, this is the race before us. This is the run that we need to per persevere in. Ibram Kendi, uh, in his book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, talks about things that are either racist or anti-racist. And it seems really simple, but I have found it is really challenging for me to think about every word, every thought, every action, and consider and interrogate that. Um, and yet, it's also incredibly liberating. It's powerful work. It's transformational. Like these folks, they have been transformational in our world. Um, and we need to step up and be that same transformational experience. These saints nudge me. They cheer me on. They nod in agreement. Occasionally they chastise me and hold me accountable. But we as a church, let us run with perseverance because it is beautiful and wonderful thing. Speaking of beautiful and wonderful, What's the process in creating one of these iconic queer saints? Yeah, um, I mean, as I, I said before, you know, like I, um, were, the, the original batch of uh, um, saints were, were relied heavily on, on, on historical f photographs. And when I was asked to kind of come back to the project and um, kind of uh, do it right, as it were, I, I, initially I, I had wanted to illustrate all of them um, by hand, but we just didn't have the time, which is why we relied on the kind of photo montage um, kind of style. Um, and so uh, most of the, um, I, I, I work heavily from photo reference, but then I, uh, I was looking for a, a kind of a, a vocabulary on how to kind of, um, kind of enthrone these saints in, in their majesty. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I was really inspired by one, Marsha. Um, she had this habit of uh, adorning herself with flowers, um, silk and real. Um, and as I thought more about that, I was also reminded of um, Kehinde Wiley's work, mm -hmm. where he uh, uses a lot of kind of foliage mm -hmm. and flowers and th this kind of like really luscious Im Im you know, imagery that, that literally kind of um, encircles his subjects met many times. And so I was really drawn to the idea that we could use like the majesty of God's creation mm -hmm. to uplift these queer saints. Um, so oftentimes, you know, like the, the, the flowers or plants that are used in the halo are, um, I try and select flowers that are um, indicative of something. For example, like June Jordan's um, is, in, is enshrined by hibiscus, which is a reference to her uh, native Jamaica. Um, Stormy de Larvery, uh, she is, uh, has these nightshade flowers because she worked in the um, uh, nightlife scene and um, was a very kind of a mysterious and sexy. So I, I associated those with her. So um, I, I tried to kind of um, really get in touch with the spirit of each of the subjects. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So we're in the midst of a transition and um, I serve on the transition committee and these queer saints, I feels like are looking over my shoulder during this transition time and looking over our shoulders. And so I want to challenge us to think about how these queer saints uh, lived and pushed for change. They claimed it, they named it, um, and we need to follow their example. We need to embrace this time of change for Judson. It's a transformational moment for Judson uh, to look at our past and claim it, but not rest on our past. This is a chance for us to look to the future, for us to think about and dream about what we could and who we could be as a church. 
And these queer saints will guide us, uh, thanks to Jason. Um, these queer, saint, queer saints can attest that it isn't an easy process, but it's worth it. The journey we're on right now in this church is transformational. Jason, Judson, may it be so. Amen. Lisa Holton will invite us into our time of offering. As she is sharing the offering, you'll see on your screen uh, three options to contribute to Judson via Venmo using at Judson Memorial Church. Or second, you can text Judson to 44321 or go online to judson.org forward slash give. Lisa? Good morning, Judson. Happy Pride. We've come to the part of the service where we think about giving back to the place that's given us so much. So I'd like to ask you to join me to take a moment and just think about what you're grateful for this Sunday. For me, when I think about gratitude on Pride Sunday at Judson, uh, what immediately comes to mind is one of my personal living, breathing saints. And that would be the spiky-haired, Dolly Parton-loving, flannel shirt wearing, nail polish, glitter waving, Reverend Micah Busey. Long before I actually met Micah, he made me feel like I belonged here, not in spite of who I was, but because of it. He also showed me the connection between my queerness and my faith. And he challenged me to think about what queer spiritual community means and how we show up and care for each other. So I'm gonna take a moment and get wonky because can you really celebrate Micah without getting wonky? When I was thinking about him, I went back to his sermon, Bending the Rainbow, uh, on July 26, 2017. You can find it on the Judson Facebook page and I highly recommend it. I'm not gonna do it justice, but I'm just gonna hit the highlights. So he starts by celebrating Gilbert Baker and the rainbow flag. Then he connects the flag with the rainbow that appeared as God made her covenant with Noah, disavowing her violence and promising love. And then he leaps immediately to the story of Ham and tells us how that story, which is about humans turning against humans, has been used by European Christianity for centuries as a weapon of white supremacy and how those weapons have been passed down and are still being used to harm and kill our modern day saints like Mark Carson, Tony McDade, and far too many others. And then Micah turns with so much love to those of us who are queer and white. And he asks us where we are in that fight. Are we caring for and standing up with the people in our community most harmed by those weapons? And then he brings us all the way back to Gilbert Baker and he quotes him by saying, if we are a movement, we have to move something, we have to change something. And then Micah extends an invitation to all of us to bend the rainbow together. So Micah, I accept. Thank you for always inspiring me to try to move something, to change something. And most of all, thank you so much for making me feel so loved in this beautiful queer Judson family. I am wishing you peace, wellness, love, and so, so much glitter this Sunday morning. Thank you.
We have a special guest to send us forth before our closing hymn when we proclaim the kingdom, the queendom, and the kingdom of God. The more and more each of us becomes convinced that we will survive, that is the time that we have to look around us and make sure that everyone else around us has the tools and the support to also survive. There can be no gay pride without true queer liberation. Come out every day. It's not just a one-time thing. Come out as queer. Come out against white supremacy. Come out against patriarchy and keep bending that rainbow. You're not in it alone. We are all bending this rainbow together trying to get to the queer other side. And as we always say at the end of our Judson service, this service is ending. But our queer service in the world continues. Whether you're marching in the streets today or whether you're marching in your heart, make sure that you are moving something. Make sure that you are changing something. Make sure that you are queering something. And let's bend this rainbow. Let's bend this moral arc of the universe together until all feel liberated, and all are actually free. Amen.